Okay, so this is part three. <clears throat> um, I misspoke a little bit at the last lecture uh, when I talked about muon's lifetime. I said 10.2 divided by gamma is 2.07. It's 2.03. Okay, and that's important because now we will do the same analysis from muon's frame and we will also get 2.03. Um, in any case, so <clears throat> How do things look like from Muon's perspective? You see, the fact of arrival or not arrival to the ground cannot depend on the reference frame. Muon either makes it or it doesn't. Let's say there's a bomb on the earth that's triggered by Muon's arrival. And if Muon arrives, bomb goes up and, and, and people die. It can't be that from one frame, people appear to live, but from the other, they appear to die, okay? There can be a disagreement uh, about explanation, <clears throat> as we will see in a moment. There can be a disagreement about the length of time or the amount of space that something that that takes place between the two events. But uh, there cannot be a disagreement on the fact of something happening or not happening. So let's see. From Muon's perspective, Muon lives 2.2 microseconds. And muon sees the Earth's surface approach it at speed v. Okay, that's regular relative motion issue. And uh, we already saw that that speed v uh, times 2.2 uh, microseconds uh, comes out to be a lot less than the thickness of the atmosphere, three kilometers. <clears throat> or, the relevant part of the atmosphere. But clearly, again, the outcome cannot depend on the reference frame. So somehow muon, there has to be another explanation from muon's perspective why it does reach the ground. Because uh, V times the lifetime is less than H. But it does reach the ground. For sure, it reaches the ground. And so what's the resolution to this? The only possibility is that the muon sees that the distance between the location where it was born and the ground is shorter than three kilometers. So while the explanation for why the muon reaches the ground from the Earth's perspective is that all the processes uh, in muon's frame tick much slower or unfold much slower the explanation from muon's perspective is that the distances in the direction of muon's motion have shrunk. Thus, the muon thinks that it has less distance to travel. Well, less distance to travel takes less time, so it can survive that shorter travel during its lifetime. Okay, and so this idea that distances are contracted this is the third famous consequence of Einstein's postulate, and this is called length contraction. Okay, so that's the third effect. And we'll examine it now, but I want to remark that this example with muon is, is, is instructive also because it indicates that while explanations or interpretations can differ from frame to frame, the physical predictions have to agree, okay? Muon either reaches the ground or it doesn't. There can't possibly be a disagreement about that. And we will see that again and again in special relativity. I'll have more to say about that. Uh, so let's study length contraction, okay? So let's say this is the ground. And there's a rod, so this is a mark. There's a rod moving past you. Okay, so this is a rod with speed v, okay? What is the length of the rod? Now, there are two ways to measure the length of the rod. You could either measure, you can make the markings of both ends simultaneously. So you have to make a simultaneous measurement. Or you can actually measure the time. And if you know the speed, you can infer the distance, okay? So let's think about that. That's an easier way uh, to think about length contraction. 
Okay, so one way to measure it is to measure the time that it takes between the first event, the front of the rod passes this marking, and the second event, the back of the rod passes this mark. Okay, so this is, let's say, this is event one, the front of the rod is just about to pass the marking. So this is event one. And later, as it has moved, this is event two. Okay. So here's the marking, and the rod continues uh, on its journey. Event one, event two. So you place the clock at this location with zero at event one, and you measure the time interval. So the length of the rod is the speed of the rod times the time interval, right? So L equals V times tau. So tau equals time of event and two, okay? So F zero. Okay, so we set clocks to be zero at event one, and when the rod back end of the rod has passed, it took time tau. Now, why do I write tau? Why am I using letter tau? Because the two events happen at the same location in this frame. Okay, so the time interval measured in this frame is a proper time. Okay, so that's, uh, so this is, so this is frame, frame S. Okay, so this is frame S. And now there, there's a frame S prime that's attached to the rod. Okay, so from, from frame S prime frame attached to the rod. So what do they see? So a person at rest relative to the rod can also use time difference to measure the length of the rod. Now what they see is they see the mark pass by them. This is all normal. This is Again, regular relative motion. So what kind of time difference will they measure? They measure the time difference between the same pair of events when the mark passes the front of the rod and the mark passes the end of the rod. So what they see is they see the following. So this is, so this is, let's see, so this is front and this is back. So this is front and this is back. So this is, event one and later so this is event two okay and they can say also t equals zero at event one and so event two happens at time delta t it happens delta t later so I don't actually have to set this to zero. I can just look at time intervals. It's not necessary to set this time to zero, but okay. Okay, so they measure time difference delta t between the same pair of events. Mark passes the front of the rod and mark passes the back of the rod. And so they, they, would, they would say that length, let's call it L prime, equals V times delta t. The speed of the mark relative to them is the speed of the rod the same as the speed of the rod relative to frame s. So now what we have is we have L prime equals V delta T versus L equals V times tau. And which one is larger? 
in the frame at which the rod is moving, the two events happen at the same location. So the time interval between the pair of events measured in that frame is less than the time interval uh, uh, between the same pair of events measured in the other frame. You see, wow, wow is less than the t. So you conclude that L is less than L prime. So therefore, the person who is moving relative to the rod will conclude that the rod is shorter than the person uh, who is at rest relative to the rod. And this effect is called length contraction. Now, the way I presented it is I presented the length measurement through time measurement. So you can see that the fact that moving objects uh, are contracted is a direct consequence of uh, time dilation the way that I presented. And I think that's the simplest way to see it. Let me introduce a term. We talked about proper time as the time between a pair of events that took place at the same location in a certain frame. Okay, so uh, I'm going to introduce a term called proper length. which is the length of an object measured in the frame and which that object is at rest. It is common to call it L naught. Okay, I'm going to switch from L prime to L naught. So we have. Let's do a little bit of formulas. We have L equals V times tau, and L naught. I'm switching from L prime to L naught because I introduced proper length. Equals V times delta T equals V times gamma tau. It's a uh, larger you know, interval of time equals gamma times L. So L equals L naught over gamma. Okay, now gamma is bigger than one, so L is less than L naught. Gamma is bigger than one, so L is less than L naught. And so this is uh, moving objects are contracted. Okay, so going back to the muon, let's do the math. We're going back to the muon. The distance it has to travel according to the muon is Remember L equals L naught over gamma. L naught equals three kilometers. Okay, because when we say three kilometers, we're at rest relative to in the atmosphere. Travel, uh, it has to travel a distance of three kilometers divided by 5.03. Okay, that's a gamma. That's 597 meters. So muon thinks that the thickness of the atmosphere or the, of the portion of the atmosphere through which it has to travel is only 597 meters. Well, it's moving at 0.98 speed of light. How long does it travel? How long does it take to cover that distance? It takes 597 meters divided by 0 0.98 times 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. 
equals 2.03 microseconds, where we saw that enough time to survive the journey. Okay. So in discussing the relativity of simultaneity, we assumed that distances transverse to the motion stay the same in both frames. Uh, and they do stay the same. So I've just shown that distances in the direction of the motion are contracted, or uh, segments of length in the direction of the motion are contracted. You have a homework problem which guides you, it's from the textbook, to, to convince yourself that distances that are transverse or perpendicular to the direction of motion are, are not contracted. I'm just going to write it down and you think about it. So it feels weird to write on this. It's kind of slippery. Okay, this is in the homework. See you tomorrow. Bye.